Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 10th Halan Science Industry and Business International Conference or HACIP 2017. My name is Marisa Manpa. I will be your Master of Ceremony in this afternoon. Uh, first, before we uh, start the session, may I inform you the program for uh, this afternoon. The technical session two is Halan Literacy, Role and Responsibility of Muslim Scientists for Halan Industry. And after uh, the coffee break, this, the technical session three, which is an oral presentation of Halan Science Industry and Innovation, will be start at 4.15 p.m. We have uh, seven present presentations in, in this session. Uh, I have something to inform you again before uh, starting the session. For the participant who would like to receive the certificate, you need to have the QR code scan for your, of, of your tag for registration of every session you participated in order it to be indicated in your uh, certificate, certificate. And the certificate will be sent to you via email later. We also have the uh, online system for Q&A and evaluation. You can ask or leave any message to the speaker during and uh, after the presentation by scanning uh, the QR code on, on the paper you, you receive in front of this room to log into the system. Uh, in addition, we also have the uh, English Thai translation uh, for those who would like to uh, would like to get the headphone for the translation. You can uh, you can contact to the staff in in the back of this room. Okay. Now we are about to start the session, the technical session two. The theme of session is. Halan Literacy, Role and respons Responsibility of Muslim Scientists for Halan Industry. May I invite the chairperson of this session, Professor Dr. Irwandi Jaswir from International Islamic University, Malaysia, to please, to, to, to please proceed to the stage to share the session. And now I would like to invite speakers of this session to please join the session chairperson on the stage. First is Mufti Ali Mufti Arif Ali Shah from Hansa, Africa. Professor Dr. Mozart Abdelwaha from National Research Center, Egypt. Professor Dr. Nazima Hamid from Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. And Dr. Dasi Hanufi from Bogor Agricultural University, Indonesia. Please welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Irwandi Jaswir. Dr. Irwandi uh, is a Nobel Professor in Food Chemistry and Biochemistry as well as the Halan Food Management. Currently a Professor at the Department of Bio uh, Biotechnology Kuleya of Engineering in the International Islamic University, Malaysia or IAUM. Director of International Institute, Institute for Halan Research and Training and Secretary of Calcine of Professor at IAUM. He received his bachelor degree in food, in food Technology and Human Nutrition from Bogor Agriculture University, Indonesia, MSc in Food Science and Biotechnology from University Britannian Malaysia and PhD in food chemistry and biochemistry from University Putra Malaysia. Being an expert in various fields, Professor Irwandi has always been invited by various institutions and conferences, both locally and international, to present his views on academic matter. He has received various local and international awards for his excellent work in the research and education and invited as a reviewer of international journal articles. He has more than 200 publications in international uh, scientific journals and also have uh, book chapters 
and also proceeding of international conference. Dr. Irwandi, please share your session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session uh, Halal Literacy, Roles and Responsibilities of Muslim Scientists for Halal Industry. In this session, we have six presenters from various countries. And the first presenter is uh, Dr. Hani Mansur Al Mazidi uh, from Kuwait, uh, from Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Hani cannot make it to this session. Um, and his presentation will be presented by Dr. Mufti Arif Alisha. And the title of the presentation is Physiochemical Transformation Istihala of Things of Inhala Industry. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyil kareem. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassil li amri. Wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. <coughs> the topic is istihala in the light of Islamic fiqh. If we summarize the discussion outline, there are few points we will try to be clear. First of all, what is the definition of istihala? What istihala is? And second, viewpoint of different Islamic schools of fiqh regarding istihala, especially Hanafi school of fiqh viewpoint we would like to clear. And the fourth point is practical implementation of istihala concept in various industries. And the last one, can we adopt the istihala concept in halal standards or halal certification? <clears throat> the term istihala, when we read the Islamic books of fiqh, we find various words carrying the same meaning, that is qalbul mahiyya, Inqilab al Mahiya, Inqilab al Ain, al Istihala, etc. As well as when we come to English, in English books, these terms is used as transformation, substantial change, change of state, change of nature, etc. <coughs> what is the definition of Istihala? As we see, in Arabic wordings, we can translate in the Sharia istihala of one substance or transformation of one substance into completely another substance is called istihala. And here under we see the various references of various school of fiqh like Imam Abu Hanifa 
from Shafi school of fiqh, we see the book of Imam Nawawi, Rahimahullah, and from Maliki school of fiqh, we see here the various books, especially a very most popular book of Maliki school of fiqh, Mawahibul Jalil, that is explanation of Mukhtasarul Halil. <coughs> What is istihala concept? I would like to clear this point on the very early stage that istihala is not unanimously agreed upon concept, but it is discreet, disagreed upon concept amongst Islamic jurists. And if we, if we conclude, we can say that this concept is specially developed by Hanafi school of fiqh and basically the concept of istihala or transformation or change of state is not accepted by other school of fiqh other than Hanafi school of fiqh. So the first point that here we have that Istihala concept is basically adopted, developed, established by Hanafi school of fiqh. So, when we come to Hanafi school of fiqh, what are details regarding Istihala in Hanafi school of fiqh? The second point I would like to clear some misconceptions, misunderstanding, and some points regarding istihala concept, which we daily listen and hear about Hanafi school of fiqh. So let me explain that in Hanafi school of fiqh, the concept of istihala is also not unanimously agreed upon. Why? Because we know that the Hanafi school of fiqh is developed basically in the very initial time by three great scholars. One is the founder, Imam Abu Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Sabit, and two his students, Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad. This concept, in the very early days of Islamic fiqh, especially in Hanafi school of fiqh, was established and described by Imam Muhammad, that is the junior student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa in himself, we have no reference in Hanafi school of fact books that what is his own viewpoint regarding istihala. But after 600 years back later, Imam Sarakhsi and other Hanafi scholars described that Imam Abu Hanifa is also agreed with Imam Muhammad. But at the same time, the senior student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf, Rahimahullah, he is not agreed with this concept. And he is agreed with other schools of fiqh like Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, uh, Al Fiqh al Jafri, etc. And they don't accept the concept of istihala as a mean of purity, as a mean of halalness, as a mean of conversion, as a mean of sharia ruling. So, the third point. What is the real viewpoint of Imam Muhammad bin al-Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, from Hanafi school of fiqh? The first point, in his opinion, that the concept of istihala was given by Imam Muhammad. But if we look for a definition, for a criteria, for, for an uh, exact concept of istihala, there is no definition given by Imam Muhammad 
Al Hanafi. Yes, he gave some examples. He described why examples this concept. And also, when he says that istihala is the mean for purity, for tahara, for halalness of some things, he says that this concept is basically given and taken by Sunnah, the Hadith, and the saying of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The definition and criteria for istihala concept was established by later on the scholars of Hanafi school of fiqh like Imam Allama Kasani, the author of Badayu Sanai, and Imam Saraksi, the author of popular and famous book of Hanafi school of fiqh, Al Mabsud, and Ibn Abidin, the very latest and most authentic scholar of Hanafi school of fiqh. The fourth point regarding istihala in Hanafi school of fiqh is misconceptions, misunderstanding. Our Muslim brothers, those follow other school of fiqh and they are not followers the Hanafi school of fiqh, they have some misconceptions and they, they, uh, there are some misunderstanding. The first one, that even this concept is accepted and given by Imam Muhammad, the Hanafi scholar. But let's see and have a review of this concept that either this concept is absolutely accepted, unconditional, are accepted with some conditions. The second part, <coughs> that even this is the opinion of Hanafi school of fiqh, and they say and they accept is as a mean and source of tahara, of halalness for products. But when, what is the condition? Is this is, this is the absolute and unconditional fatwa ruling of Hanafi school of fiqh or there are some conditions and barriers for this conception. So, let me clear that in our Hanafi school of fiqh that we follow, this concept is not unconditional. To give ruling, to issue fatwa regarding istihala, there is a very big and there are some great barriers given and established by Hanafi school of fiqh and the very most important condition and the basic condition is that we can issue fatwa, we can give ruling regarding uh, based on istihala only if we are stuck and in strict condition and there is some indispensable case and we have no way at that time, Hanafi school of fact say that yes, no, if you have some solution come from istihala, you can follow. So this is misconception that Hanafi school of fact gave us some means or some sources for istihala, for halalness that are against Sharia. No, this is not right. We have to study Hanafi school of fact, Hanafi school of fact. And this concept is, they have some conditions, some barriers to issue fatwa and to rule about halalness of products, etc. So, we have here four points. That this concept of istihala is not agreed upon, unanimously accepted by four school of fiqh. First of all, it comes to Hanafi school of fiqh. In Hanafi school of fiqh, this is also not unanimously accepted upon concept. This is only given by Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Yes, Imam Abu Hanifa also agree with him. And third, very important point to be noted that fatwa, ruling and standard or criteria of istihala 
we issue only if we are in stuck condition we are in emergency condition we have no way we have no basic normal condition there we go to istihala therefore imam ibn abidin shami rahimahullah the atraf raddul muhtar the most authentic book of hanafi school of fiqh latest given by 100 years ago that we cannot issue fatwa based on istihala if there is no umumi balwa there is no ibtila ul aam there is no stuck condition there is no uh, strictly we if if we have some other ways we have some alternates we will not go to istihala so the concept of istihala in the modern industry there are some other terms taken by modern sciences and this is also a misconception some people describe istihala as a chemical change now chemical change is not istihala chemical change absolutely is not istihala yes if it is according the condition of hanafi school of fiqh then we can say that some points some forms and some shapes of chemical change we can uh, fall under the concept of istihala the second filtration is not istihala it is uh, absolutely categorically described in the books of hanafi school of fiqh that filtration is not istihala it will not treated as istihala for the mean and for the source of halalness for the source of tahara now the mixture is not istihala clearly the mixture is not istihala extraction is not istihala evaporation is not istihala we have hundred of examples bundle of examples upon these things the filtration the mixture the extraction the evaporation if it comes from najas means it will be treated as najas it will be treated as najas as haram what about gelatin gelatin is can we say the gelatin is example for istihala or no and does gelatin fulfill the conditions of istihala or no so the answer is no why you mashallah are technical experts and you know better than me that gelatin is maximum extraction filtration treatment of some things this is not istihala we cannot say gelatin is the one part taken and extracted from a, a mass ingredient in product so upon is per our research is per our understanding gelatin is not example for istihala and gelatin will be treated as the source if it is from halal source it will be halal if it is from haram source it will be considered haram the last point can we adopt istihala concept for standardization or for halal certification so it is not allowed to use istihala as a mean of halalness or tahara in normal condition as we described earlier that istihala has some barriers some conditions even in hanafi school of fiqh this is not for normal condition this is for emergency condition if we have no way no alternate and we are stuck in life saving condition then we will go to istihala we may go to istihala in in the language of standard if i say it is not with shall it is not with should it is not with can we may go to istihala is i so describe if we may go to istihala and this is for emergency and you know better than me that emergency preparedness is a part of standard it is not standard when we develop standard for normal condition not for emergency so istihala in hanafi school of fiqh was basically accepted for emergency condition so at last i would like to say that even from hanafi school of fiqh and as a hanafi follower as a hanafi scholar we cannot recommend istihala for standardization for halal certification and for halal industry
we will go completely upon source if the source is halal the product will be halal if the source is haram the product will be haram jazakumullah khaira thank you uh, mufti arif ali shah um, if you have a question please keep first and then we have a question and answer session toward the end of the session i would like to call upon now the second speaker professor dr musad abdul wahab he is a food toxicology and contaminant expert from department national research center cairo egypt and the president of the egypt society of science and halal products a uh, little bit about uh, professor musad uh, his expertise is toxicology food safety and nanotechnology uh, with the qualification you can see in the screen uh, phd in animal physiology toxicology master in animal physiology um, and a uh, bachelor in agriculture science uh, all of them from cairo egypt without further ado i would like to call upon promosat who would like to give a talk entitled aspects of darura or necessity and its halal application in pharmaceuticals and non food materials tafadhal bismillahirrahmanirrahim السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I am going to talk to you now about the uh, aspect of darura in the system and its halal application in pharmaceutical and non-food and non-food materials. Okay, okay. That's okay. More. Uh, very broadly, halal and the haram concentrated on food and the paper. However, the halal and the haram aspect of medicinal product started to attract serious attention. Several reports were published on the awareness of halal pharmaceutical and medication. Health care providers introduced the halal alternative in the formulation of medicinal product regardless the legal and religious basis of its status. Advancement in medicine has improved the quality of human life and increased life expectancy however some medical application have raised ethical concern among the public one of these concerns is about the permissibility of the application from the an islamic perspective especially when it is involved with impermissible things as the only available remedy. Hence, the following, the following question is right. Is there any room for mitigation, mitigation? And to what extent may such condition mitigate publication, prohibition? To answer this question, we have to explain how these conflicts can be resolved from a religious perspective for medical health care policy maker and the public as a whole. Further, a connection between religion and medicine should be established. Muslims may face hardship and thus may have an exception, which is called in Islam, Rukhsa. 
to Sharia in order to ease the hardship and prevent greater harm. This permission is considered, is consistent with the core of Islam for miracle upon humankind. يقول الله تعالى الله سيس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجاهدوا في الله حق جهاده هو اجتباكم وما جعل عليكم في الدين من حرج الله سبحانه وتعالى سيس ذات and serve in his cause as you ought to serve with sincerity and under discipline So, mitigation or takfif in Islam may be extended to those who suffer from other types of hardship, such as hunger and biological defect. Of this mitigation, darura or necessary, necessity which may be defined as an extreme situation in which a human faces extreme hardship and is in dire need to, of something to elevate this hardship. Allah Ta'ala says, إنما حرم عليكم الميتة والدم ولحم الخنزير وما أهل به لغير الله فمن اضطر غير باغ ولا عاد فلا اسم عليه إن الله غفور رحيم فمن اضطر هنس دارورة هذه هي هذه فور بيدن يو أنلي كريشان بلاد أند فليش أوف ذا سواين أند ذات ويتش هاز بين أوفرد تو أذر ذان الله بات Should someone be forced? Should someone be forced? This is the exception. Without being rebellious or transgressive, there shall be no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. Allah Taala say to. حرمت عليكم الميتة والدم ولحم الخنزير وما أهل به لغير الله والمنخنقة والموقوذة والمتردية والنطيحة وما أكل السبع إلا ما زكيتم وما ذبح على النصب وأن تستقسموا بالأذلام ذلك فسق اليوم يأس الذين كفروا من دينكم فلا تخشوهم واخشوهم اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا فمن اضطر في مخمصة غير متجانف لإسم فإن الله غفور رحيم اضطر من but whenever is forced by severe hunger with no inclination to sins in indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. Yaqulu Aidan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to Kulla Ajdu Fima Uhiya Ilaya Muharraman Alaya Ta Taimin Yatumu Illa an Yakuna Mait Maitatan Aw Daman Masfuhan Aw Lahma Khanzirin فإنه رجس أو فسق وهل الغير الله فيه فمن اضطر غير باغ ولا عاد فإن ربك غفور رحيم Take care of some words اضطر فإذا اضطررتم اضطر فارسد The last sentence of the آية But whenever is forced by necessity neither addressing it nor trans, uh, transgressing its limit, then indeed your Lord is forgiving and merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says too, 
وما لكم ألا تأكلوا مما ذكر اسم الله عليه وقد فصل لكم ما حرم عليكم إلا ما اضطررتم إليه وإن كثيرا لا يدلون بأهوائهم بغير علم إن ربك هو أعلم بالمعتدين Take care also of accepting that to which you are complete. Allah Taala say to, إنما حرم عليكم ميتة والدم ولحم الخنزير وما أهل الغير الله به فمن اضطر غير باغ ولا عاد فإن الله غفور رحيم. But whoever is forced by necessity, neither dressing nor transgressing is the limit, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. Hence, what is darura? We have some definition of darura, but the most suitable one is based on the above mentioned holy verses. Darura is defined as the extreme, the extreme necessity or need which the Muslim cannot manage without. It can occur any time. Therefore. There is no specific time given to a person to save himself from harm. He does not have to wait for such an extreme situation to continue in any one day period before commit, committing the unfold action. Then Darura is exception, but it is not exception, open exception, but there is some limitation for the Darura. I will talk. So what's the application of Darura? When we can applica applica application? Darura should only apply if it meets the following conditions. One, the need is compelling. Very urgent. The need for the thing is very, very urgent. Without this thing, maybe I harm myself, I die. I... So, no way. Second, the standard of the, the need is established based on the need of a majority of the public or a group if it is a specific need. So, not everyone needs to apply the rule for himself. No, if a problem for the public, we can apply the rule. But even if one person, but it is very, very limited, there is no lawful way to fulfill such need. If, for coming, committing, and an unlawful action is only allowed for limited time, and to extent that is sufficient to remove the hardship. If the problem is finished, you can you can apply the rura. Apply the rura only in specific thing. If this thing is okay, there is no the rura is required. The permission must be, must not conflict with any ruling on the need with specific arrangements in the Quran and the Sunnah, or any ruling based on a stranger class. Current application, current practice in the rura, in medication and treatment, I will not talk about food, only medication and uh, non-food matters. Medicine and pharmaceutical materials are those used for treatment in order to relieve or prevent illness in human and increase their hygienic level. It can be used orally through anus or any opening injected, implanted under the skin or applied onto the skin in the form of cream. With the advancement of the science and technology, most discoveries were made to increase the quality of human life causing various genetics and medical biotechnological engineering. These materials may be forbidden for Muslims, 
but used in the treatment of critical disease, such as thermobosis, heart surgery, hemodialysis, and critical medicinal products, such as vaccine and antibiotics and health supplements. Examples for uh, very miserable medicine due to Darura. Borosine insulin injection for diabetic patient. Hence, several types of insulin are already found in the market. But not all the people uh, can uh, see you for, by this type. So the birth, uh, borosine insulin may be very, very important for some people, for some patients. Other insulin cannot be affected. So, in this case, the Rura, we can apply the Rura and we can use the Borosine insulin if there is no way. Vaccines against different diseases such as uh, minimum antimatrix, biotrax, this is already in the market. This These products are already in the market, and most of them contain borosine and contain lawful materials. Medicines that contain alcohol and the drugs, such as those used in the surgery, they give them to the patient. No way, I can't make any surgery for the patient without I give him drugs to sleep. Medicines that contain an impure substance derived from swine. Low molecular weight heparin. This is very, very important because there are, very, uh, there are several types of heparin in the market. Low molecular and high molecular weight. Okay. So, low molecular weight is very important and we cannot use it without uh, the big and uh, the swine. Uh, Borosine insulin injection for diabetes. But for the uh, other drugs such as the implantable columnar lens for eye treatment, is okay. Treatment of brain dead patient is very important. Organ transportation and donation. Islam is not against organ transplantation. transplantation. If they can save human life or restore the basic function of a human body, a consist must be taken or obtained from the donor or his next skin after his death or the head of the Muslim community if he does not have any next skin or if the body is not identified. Organ trade is very, very strictly prohibited. But also the prohibited uterine donation and transplantation, genetical, gen genital organ transplantation, this is all prohibited. Because the uterine environment may have an influence on the biological development of the personality of the child. Having a biological child cannot be considered as basic human system for the Islamic perspective. Management of the crop. The autopsy donating crops for research purpose, it is okay. The surgery and autopsy procedure on a Muslim cross can only be con conducted if there is in the, in the system, such as for chemical investigation purpose, or donating as, uh, crops for research purpose, and not uh, uh, the management of crops. In the Rura, the autopsy can be conducted due to the following justification: to investigate the cause of this organ, to verify the disease, in order to take preventive precautions and appreciate treatment for, the, for such disease, 
for educational purposes, especially in the faculty of medicine. The autopsy of educational purposes must observe the following matter, consists of from the dedicated before this or next kind, next kind if after this must be obtained a mutation, a mutation must be uh, done minimally yet enough to fulfill the requirement. Autopathy of female crop cannot be done. Can be done by a male doctor if there is no female doctor can do it. All parts of the crop must be paired after the autopathy. In conclusion, the rural alone mitigation where be a Muslim can commit an unfold action or omit an obligation to uh, delay it or delay it. This mitigation is consistent with, consistent with the objective of Sharia, which aim to preserve the basic human necessities, namely religious life, intellect, uh, lineage, and wealth. As for standard condition, Muslim scholars have explained that the Darura must rely exit and mitigation is the, the only way to release the unfortunate person from the extreme situation or to prevent greater harm from being inflicted upon him. Mitigation is only allowed for a limited period of time and to a limited extent which is considered sufficient for Muslim to escape from such an uh, extreme situation. Nevertheless, this mitigation may only be allowed under certain conditions. And these conditions may vary from case to case. With regard to a medical case, a Muslim must consult an expert for a prescription and approval to find out whether Darura really, uh, Darura really exit and whether the mitigation is allowed. Given that all the condition must be met, not all medical applications that contain unlawful ingredient or involve unlawful method are permissible. Nevertheless, a fatwa or permissibility is subject to change, meaning that it is only valid as long as there is no valuable lawful application. Therefore, Muslims are encouraged to consult experts to get the, la the latest update about the available remedy. Apart from that, Muslims should be more innovative and develop medical application that are in harmony with their religious teaching. Thank you very much. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mossad, who already explained to us very interesting topic on uh, uh, darura, on necessity. A few messages that I can... Uh, uh, taken from this, this I uh, can take very important notes from his presentation is that uh, Darura concept is the extreme necessity in it for Muslim uh, that we cannot manage without that, yeah? such as uh, various application in medical yeah, application just now, uh, porcine, insulin for example organ transplant and also uh, uh, other medical applications. Okay, from um uh, istihala and then darura and then we move now to the synthetic biology and the next speaker would be Professor Dr. Nazima Hamid 
uh, from Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. But before that, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Manat Substantikul to sit in the front. Yeah. Mr. Mana will re uh, replace yeah, uh, Professor Winay Dahlan in the last uh, topic. So, Professor Dr. Nazima will uh, talk about the synthetic biology and modern meat science. Please, Prof. Assalamu alaikum, uh, conference delegates and uh, the HACCP organizing committee. I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to present on a topic on synthetic biology and modern meat science. So, do you know what, have you all heard of in vitro meat before this? Has anyone here? heard about term like that. Okay, that's good. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, something that I'll be talking up about a bit and elaborating on it. But a bit about uh, myself, I come from Malaysia. Uh, that's often the question that people ask me. But I've been in New Zealand for 11 years and uh, it's the land of long white clouds. And uh, in Maori, that's our national language after English. It's known as Aotearoa. So this is my adopted homeland now. And uh, in New Zealand, we have a population of 4 million. And for every six sheep, we have one people, person. Yeah, so uh, we have more sheep and cattle than human beings in, in New Zealand. And see, that's the sort of things that come up in news. So, a bit about in vitro meat. I'll talk about how it works. And um, basically, you extract a tissue from a live animal, so the animal is not killed. And uh, from this, you extract stem cells. And uh, what you then do is culture them, and then you bulk them up by putting them in you know, chambers, and, uh, and then you get them to be a beef patty. So up till now, people have not actually constructed meat to, to, to be consumed as a steak, for example. So most of them are minced, and um, the most common form is the beef patty. So why is there a move uh, towards in vitro meat production? And uh, New Zealand is a very good example. Yeah, we have so few people, yet we have so many animals. And New Zealand has got a very, low, very, very strong stance in terms of environment. And the environmental impacts are so important because we have so many sheep and cattle. We get them to emit greenhouse gases. All right, so GHG is uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it uses a lot of energy. Uh, it involves a lot of land use, so if you go to New Zealand, you'll see lots of uh, animals grazing in, you know, big stretches of land. And of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, water use as well. And New Zealand wants to maintain that green, clean image that uh, they've always had, but because our rivers are getting polluted, okay, by, by the animals, and you know, our greenhouse gas emissions are increasing because again, we are located in the south uh, and we're quite near the ozone layer. So these are all things that um, we need to consider. And I believe that within six to 10 years time, maybe this is the way to go in vitro meat. So um, it's really, uh, there's increasing in interest in this area. And uh, if you look there, they look, they've had um, beef, sheep, pork, poultry, and cultured meat. And you can see cultured meat produces way less, yeah? Um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, less energy. 
and um, lower land use and low water use. So, so it's, it's something that, you know, we as a country have to uh, consider seriously. So, um, there have been a couple of companies, and this is uh, not Impossible Foods. It's actually a company that is in the United States. And what they've done is they've received big fundings from Bill Gates and, and even Google to produce in vitro meat. And uh, it's quite interesting because uh, this meat does not contain meat. What they do is to extract heme, which is a component of which is a component of hemoglobin. And we always associate hemoglobin with animals. But we can actually extract it from plants. And if you look at the figure there, you can see a red color nodule. All right, that's actually heme. And it is found in, um, in, a, in the roots of, soya, of a soya plant. And it's there because it, um, it provides uh, food for the for the bacteria involved in nitrogen fixation. So what they do is, you can't be harvesting all this um, heme from these you know, roots of soya bean. So it's not technically feasible. So what they've done is to take the genes uh, from soya that codes for heme, and they insert it, they've inserted that into a yeast. So this is very environmentally friendly because you, you don't even use meat. And um, in terms of land use, it's one out of 20. In terms of water, it only consumes a quarter of the water required. And look here, greenhouse gas, you only get one eighth of what is produced when you actually you know, uh, raise li livestock. So that's, that's a big thing. But you'll be wondering, how can you get something that's derived from a plant heme to taste like meat? Right, so if you think about it, they, they, what they did, so this is a vegetarian product. And so what they've done is they've used uh, protein from different sources. And uh, they've used whey powder, they've got proteins from potato starch. Um, Conject and um, some gums here yeah, to, 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 to bind it together. And of course, what is meat without fat? So meat is not meat unless there is fat. So if you uh, want to, what they've done now is to add coconut oil. So this is a relatively healthy product, but it's purely vegetarian. And this is what it looks like. So what they call this is... Uh, vegetarian burger that bleeds so you can see um, you know what they do is once they've come up they, they do a mixture they add some flavors in there and hey presto you get a vegetarian burger that looks like a real meat burger there they've also done some work on chicken all right so there's been chicken and uh, this is uh, a company called super meat and they use again uh, the cells, stem cells from, from a chicken, and they, they grow it in a similar way uh, that I've um, talked about initially, yeah, when, when I was talking about beef, but you can see there, there's a growth chamber and meat growing machine, and what they do is um, they grow it, and, and then you can get chicken flavor. So these are all products that are out there. Yeah, but it's not been commercialized um, to, to the maximum, I would say. So, not that many papers. Uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, interest in research. So, the only research that I've really seen so far is regarding consumer perception of in vitro meat. So, it's something that um, consumers need to understand. It's no use developing a product and you know, people not knowing uh, what it is all about. So uh, this is with a group of consumers in the United States, but yet it's a study carried out in the University of Queensland. So uh, they've asked people about their willingness to eat in vitro meat, and you can see 
just looking at definitely yes or probably yes, they're about 60%. But once you ask people whether they would eat it regularly, it gets a bit lower, all right? So if you look at the numbers there, there's 6.4 and 26.2, that's a total of 32%. So it starts halving, you know? People don't, don't like the idea. You can see there's a bit of, uh, I, I don't want to eat this meat. Uh, when they asked about willingness to eat meat, yeah, IVM, yeah? Uh, as a replacement of farm meat, again, people are quite resistant to it. There's a lot of resistance. And um, willingness to eat compared to the soya substitutes, so most of the vegetarian products are made from soya, uh, people seem a bit more amenable about this. They, they seem to like it. So the percentage has increased to uh, more than uh, almost 50%. So price is an important thing. You, you can have a product like this, but how much will it cost? So cost is a very important factor when um, thinking about producing a meat like this. So these are the potential barriers to eating uh, in vitro meat. And first of all, when you eat meat, you go for the taste. You go for the flavor, yes? So, that's the potential barrier that we face. That's the biggest barrier, in fact, about 80%. And again, ethical concerns, so, but this is just 24% and uh, price, which is 20%. There's also concerns about health. This is becoming less uh, important, okay? Less an, of an important barrier. Safety, and if you look there, religious reasons, 3%. Uh, because remember, you're extracting it from a live animal. You're not, you, there's no slaughter process here. Um, and of course, you know, the barriers of uh, environmental concern and economic impact is not, not important. It was quite interesting. They, they asked people about what sort of in vitro meat people would actually want to eat. And fish came the highest. So people don't mind eating fish if it's in vitro. Uh, they would eat poultry. Poultry is next. So you can see that white meat is the preferred in vitro meat option. And then followed by pork, beef. Um, of course, uh, they threw in horse, dog and cat. I don't know why, but it was just interesting. But of course, yeah, you wouldn't eat your pets. So, um, there's a lot of uh, issues here that are important, but I'm not going to go through all this. Yes, um, I'm just showing you a snapshot of um, how important it is to look at the acceptability of uh, a meat like this before you go on, you know, trying to produce it in your lab. All right, so we know that the main thing is uh, the naturalness and people's perception of in vitro meat is that it's not natural all right and um, the concerns about animal welfare conditions is actually a plus so there's been a lot and ethical yeah I, I heard the plenary lecture today and and he mentioned about ethical as well so I, I work closely with dr. Mustafa Farouk a senior research scientist and um, he has done a lot of uh, work in um, industrial halal meat production and animal welfare. And, and that's an important thing to consider um, in halal as well. All right. On this, on, in terms of um, 3D printing, okay, so uh, that's the, the next thing that people have uh, been doing. And um, recently in Melbourne, they have 3D printed meat. And they suggested that one day we would be having this 3D printer at home and be printing our food. Okay, that, that is the future. They think, they reckon that we would have, if we had a coffee machine, we might have a 3D printer at home. But again, you've got to be careful here because what they do is they've uh, used liquefied offal and mints. And uh, basically, they use the 3D printer and um, 
that liquefied mixture acts as an ink to print your food. It's quite interesting. Uh, this is what they did in Melbourne just this year. Okay, so that's what a 3D printed meat looks like. So it gives people who are old, older consumers who, who cannot eat the tough meat an option to eat meat in this form. I've also done um, a lot of work um, looking at novel meat enriched foods for older consumers and uh, I've actually um, had about five or six papers in this area so what we did was together with Mustafa Farouk we, we wrote a review on it and again the concern was we, we need to think about the elderly so this is a good way with, to go forward in getting them proteins so um, after we published that review, we, we got some publicity and, and the Times in the UK uh, talked about our paper, yeah, about incorporating meat in ice cream, so beefed up ice cream to give elderly a boost. But uh, what is important is that in, um, in my School of Sky Science, we also have a 3D bioprinter. And I'm not saying we are going to do bioprinting like the people in Melbourne did, where you took, take a mixture of you know, liquefied mints and offal. But um, what, uh, who you see there on the, on the right is Ali Seifuddin. And he works with me. He's a pharmacologist and we do a lot of, he does a lot of 3D printing for future medicines and uh, bioactive microencapsulation and all those things that you see down there. And what, we, what is 3D printing? It's um, additive manufacturing and making 3D objects. And they've actually used this by laying down successive layers of material. So this bioprinting has been used to artificially construct living cells. Living, um, so they, they've done this for medical purposes. So if we can construct yeah, uh, tissue from human tissues, yeah, we, we can also definitely do it for, for food. So these are the sort of things they have used. Uh, manufacturing using a bioprinter. Yeah? So uh, these are all grown from human cells. So what is our idea? Our idea is why don't we try getting in vitro meat? And so we'll have a student working on this, uh, maybe this year, okay? And uh, what our idea is, is to look at printing meat uh, using stem cells and um, looking at the physical chemical characteristics, uh, their acceptability. And um, of course, yeah, um, this could be something that could be developed in the future. So, of course, yeah, uh, we, this is what Ali came up. So he struck out the, the pig there yeah, and put, put a, we're not going to work on pigs. We, we're going to use just halal animals and um, pretty much do what they did to produce in vitro meat uh, using a culture. But um, we're looking at using a 3D bioprinter to, to achieve this. So... What we can do is once we've grown, one, once we've grown them, yeah, you, you can see those little color things here. Uh, that's what we do. We add some flavor, yeah. We add some color to enhance it, probably. And then, uh, way presto, you you get your sausages or your you know whatever food or even steak that might be possible in the future. So it's just gonna totally change uh, the way we eat meat. But this is really something important to consider because, well, we've got to think about the environmental yeah, causes and um, we must um, think that really this is not going to be feasible in the long run. And so this is maybe the future way uh, we will be eating meat. Thank you. And um, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Nazima. It's very, very interesting. And we learned many new terminologies today. 
uh, impossible foods, future of our foods, 3D printing of foods, yeah? uh, in vitro meat, etc., which uh, to me is something uh, very potential, the future, but the issue of ethical need to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, now we move to the next speaker. I would like to call Dr. Dase Hunaifi uh, from Bogo Agriculture University, Indonesia. Uh, he would like to talk about awareness of fermentation in halal industry. A bit about Dr. Dase, his area of expertise in food biotechnology and bioprocess engineering. And then he completed his PhD in uh, uh, Technische University Berlin, Germany in 2013. Dr. Dase. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. A little bit uh, sleepy. So there are coffee uh, there, and uh, there are also some of the fermented products. Uh, as you know, uh, bread is a uh, bread is one of the fermented product. Okay. Uh, in this occasion, I would like to say thank you to the Halal Assembly Thailand Committee for inviting me uh, to give uh, and to share a little bit information. And this is uh, very informative also for me, uh, enlighten a new uh, technology and also a new information. And also I learned a lot about Istihala. And uh, I will convey this uh, Istihala also to my institute and also to my uh, to. Uh, other college in uh, El Pepo MY. Perhaps uh, there is uh, information again uh, about this one because I would like to share also uh, based on the uh, El Pepo MY Indonesia standard about this uh, changing uh, transformations of the material. Okay. Uh, let's uh, continue. This one about the awareness of uh, fermentations in halal industry. So as you know, uh, that uh, we know that uh, halal is not only about food, it's not uh, only about uh, fermented product, but it's all about business also. Uh, it's about uh, the, uh, our uh, Muslims' fundamental rights. But it's become also become a business, as you know. Uh, that food, uh, cosmetic, pharmaceutical, and any other industry also. Uh, using a halal as a business as well. And then awareness uh, and concerns about halal and also uh, fermentations uh, and halal. So in this outline, I would like to give an introduction about halal, microbial fermentations, and later a question and answer. So uh, one third of the food product that we consume that uh, human population consume, actually, it's uh, fermented. The other also, there are many, many, we know only about fermented foods, but also ingredients, also using the fermentations, involve the fermentation, also for the cosmetic ingredients, also for the pharmaceutical, uh, using uh, the fermentations too. So, increasing world Muslim populations, and then consumer awareness as well uh, regarding to the halal complexity of the fermentation process and we have to further elaborate the issue especially for industrial uh, processes. In terms of fermenta uh, fermentation of food, the aims of the fermentation is uh, the, to prolong safe life of the food. The second is to attain certain organoleptic uh, attributes. For example, the flavor, the new taste uh, using the fermentations. And also, uh, 
added value uh, to the food products. And then later, it's uh, improved nutritional content and possible bioactive compounds during the fermentation uh, process. So for example, Indonesian traditional fermentations, tap, tapai, and also uh, tapai ketan. So this is one of the traditional fermentations. And it, it is also, when you are making longer fermentation, it produces high amount of alcohol because it is starting from the starchy material. So this, this one is obvious, for example, the beer, uh, wine, and distillate. It is uh, obvious haram. But actually, the fermentation is not only this type of food. Fermentation is larger than that. And I would like in this one to see the decision tree of the microbial uh, products. For example, not, what about the byproduct of the, uh, of the hum hammer, for example, or uh, other product involving the fermentations? So uh, our source of regulation starting from Al-Qur'ans, Hadith, Ijma, Qiyas, and also Fatwa Ulama. But also because uh, I am a citizen of Indonesia, but also citizen of the world, but I live in Indonesia, so we have a new regulations, uh, the government decree number uh, 33, 2014. And uh, this is the microbial uh, product scope. So the product, which production process involved the use of microorganism cultivations, for example, yeast, mold, bacteria, it's become microbial products. And then the microorganism is grown in the specific media of, or, or substrates. It's part of so, as the fermentations and microbial products. So for example, uh, the bacteria need to be uh, grown needs also the carbon sources, the nitrogen sources, the vitamin for the bacteria, the mineral for the bacteria, and other substances that need by the bacteria. Of course, here we have to be concerned about halal, about the source of the uh, substrates for uh, the microorganisms that we use. So for example, if microbial products, not only food, we are talking about the thickener, for example, santan gums. We are talking about the probiotics that are also selling uh, in, the, uh, in the form of the supplements, for example. And we talk also about the acid. Acid is not only from the food, for example, the acid, uh, the acid from the lime, for example, or the, from the orange juice, but acid also can be produced by the microorganisms. And also the vitamins, the amino acids, for example, the monosodium glutamate also produced by the fermentation as well. Antibiotics, as uh, explained by uh, Professor Musad. And also hormones, as mentioned also insulin. It's, all, it's part also from the fermentations. Fatty acid, toxins, etc. involve the fermentation uh, processes. So that's why I would like to explain a little bit about the l -pepom. Uh, MUI standard in Indonesia, Majlis Ulama Indonesia. So about the microbial uh, products and halal certifications uh, for that. So this is the uh, LPPOM uh, MUI standard. That's actually the pure microbes basically are halal, as long as it is not toxic. And then the second, ingredients of the media from or refreshing media production shall not be derived from halal haram shall not be derived from harar or nazis material and then also the use of the media containing or in touch with folk derivative consider haram and then later microbial micro products grown in muta nazis media also cannot be used so that's why we have to be carefully audit and uh, analysis about uh, that material. So the decentry, any microbial product that's mentioned in the scope and uh, definitions of the microbial product, consider as a critical processes. So we have to check each step of the uh, productions 
of this uh, material. Let's take a look, for example, uh, final product. Is it categorized as hammer falling into haram material? And then ingredient, which are added to fermentation media. Does it contain pork or pork derivative? When it is contained, it falls into haram as well. Does it contain non-halal substance, but non-pork derivative, but still non-halam or najis, still cannot be used in this Enzyme are other processing aids because in the fermentations there are many also processing aids I will elaborate later. That is contain also uh, pork or pork derivatives and also the halal, uh, non-halal substance. Recommendant, for example, now uh, inserting genes into other genes when it is used, the haram gene considered still haram. Even though has already inserted many times, for example, this one, this one, this one, it is still uh, considered haram. And as you know, that uh, hammer is haram and najis at any level. So ethanol, although it's already changing, for example, not uh, become the wine or beer, it's become ethanol, pure, but still when it is part from the uh, wine industry or haram industry or homer industry, it still be part of the haram. So, uh, as, as it is mentioned, when, uh, for example, uh, we directly made the pinegar, for example, during the fermentations, not stopping in the wine, for example, before becoming the pinegar, they become the, uh, the wine. But we are not stopping. We, we intended to make, the, uh, to make the pinegar, not the wine. It is uh, actually okay, considered as a halal. But the purpose is to produce pinegar. And then, uh, for example, the others, uh, any alcoholic beverage made uh, from fermentations, from the starchy material, wine, beer, sake, or uh, in Bali, for example, Brem Bali, or, uh, or tuak, for example, in Indonesia, it's considered uh, still haram material. And also, for example, there are many byproducts during the wine productions. The use of Buso oil uh, from the wine production, I'm sorry. The use uh, of buso oil directly from the byproduct of wine still considered haram because it is from the wine uh, productions. So, uh, as mentioned, there are uh, fermentation uh, stages. This one is quite uh, the seed culture, for example, they need a substrates, uh, two uh, reactivations, also the seed culture, they are in dormancy. So when you are making the fermentation to produce some of the, uh, we have to take care about the substrates or uh, ingredient used for the media in the fermentation uh, stage. For example, this is uh, the typical fermentation processes. They need, uh, I will uh, just keep it, but when you have the questions, you can ask uh, me later. So this is uh, the critical process. The substrates or the ingredient uh, for uh, the uh, fermentations. So as mentioned, uh, there are many processing aids also. As you see, that are most common enzyme also uh, coming uh, from uh, the haram material. So we have to take care about this type of enzyme. Alpha amylase, for example, uh, and also protease uh, in trypsins, they are coming mostly are from uh, pig or haram material. So uh, this is, uh, for example, antibiotic productions. We have to check about the substrate during the seed uh, during the seeds or uh, the culture uh, propagations. And also, for example, we have to carefully also about following the fiqih in Islamic, in Islamic way that we have to clean uh, when uh, using, for example, certain substrate 
uh, there are Nazis material there, so we have to follow also the cleaning in place following the Tatir Sari. So this is uh, the processing aid that's commonly used in the fermentations. The antiform that we have to take care of also uh, during uh, the fermentations. As mentioned, the alpha amylase. And then we need also to check uh, the document uh, of material from the microbial uh, products. Laboratory analysis needed as well to confirm uh, that it is, uh, it is not uh, containing, for example, the gene from pig or from uh, pork. And also, for example, when you check the certificate of analysis, for example, this is uh, the bactopepton, one of the substrates uh, during the, uh, for the growth bacteria, for example. It is when checking, contain the porcine as well, here inside. This is the commercial yeast production, for example, that we have to take care of as well. This is the pro, uh, process flow. Uh, the yeast extract sometimes use as a, a savory flavor, as umami, to replace the monosodium glutamate, for example. Uh, this is, for example, the vitamin C produced not from the fruit, but from the bacteria, gluconobacter oxidant, through the fermentation. So the vitamin C, ascorbic acid, not only in the fruit, but you can also produce more using the bacteria. And also, for example, the monosodium glutamate that we consume even in the food, even uh, the food not fermented, for example, but this production using the fermentation as well. So we have to take care uh, as well about the uh, substrate that used for these uh, fermentations. This is also to produce, you know, aspartam. The sweeteners also can produce using the fermentation from the bacteria, from the microbe. And uh, for example, the microbial enzyme productions also using uh, the fermentations as well. There are many types of cheese. We love cheese, for example, the taste of umami, but we have to take care. Cheese is not all halal. Because during the production, although it's from the cow's milk, but during the production, rennet, for example, the sources of rennet, perhaps, from the pig. So we have to check about this one as well. Not only just uh, taking up the delicious uh, cheese, but we have to check also where it is coming from. What about the starter culture? So uh, also many other products that we have to take care. The hormone insulin productions also, as mentioned by Professor Musad's Sometimes the human pancreas cells are inserted and do the fermentation to make it more and more. So it is also considered as haram. That's why we have to take care as well for this one. Because it is when part of the human use, for example, to this one, we have to take care as well. So the in fact derived of this checking during the fermentation that we have to consider that we have to sureness it clears the dub when halal wisdom in the fermentation uh, industry is applied. Safe and soundness, peaceful of mind, when all the industry following the halal wisdom. And also, perhaps later, the satisfaction of the consumers when uh, using the halal wisdom. And hopefully, the economical growth due to the halal wisdom fermentation industry. And as mentions that food is not sometimes it's not rational because there are many food as mentions like uh, Professor uh, Nazima said, uh, printing food and also in vitro meat, for example. Food also is a culture. Many, uh, for example, in Thailand, the food in Thailand, the food in uh, Saudi Arabia, the food in New Zealand, the food in Indonesia are different. Uh, and also, food is also identity. But let still the halal wisdom change the world. All the industry has to use the halal wisdom uh, in the processes, also, uh, also the fermentations. So uh, thank you uh, for the attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dase, for a lightning talk uh, on fermentation. Yeah, uh, technology uh, it give us uh, uh, reminders. Yeah, about all the product, wide range of fermented products, from uh, starters, recombinants, uh, media used in the fermentation, various product flavoring, sweeteners, enzymes, dairy product, etc that need our uh, carefulness, yeah? When we do uh, and take certain food, especially from fermented, because one third of the food that available are fermented, yeah, our process are produced through fermentation. And now we have uh, the final speakers today, uh, Mr. Manat Subsantikul, uh, Mr. Mana will replace Associate Professor Dr. Winay Dahlan, who cannot make it. And uh, the topic uh, to be presented is about halal turning point, moving towards new prosperity of halal science. Uh, Mr. Mana, this time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, for the topic of the halal turning point, moving towards new prosperity of the halal science. We start from move Thailand from 1.0 to 4.0, smart industry, smart city, and smart people. You can see that on the first line, uh, we use the concept of the German industrial development see from 1.0 we have to use the labor intensive or steam engine until 4.0 we use the cyber technology or cyber era for the second line in Thailand we start from the 1.0 the agricultural and then we develop to be the light industry and heavy industry on the third point oh. And then now the government of Thailand have the strategy to put Thailand to be the era technology for point oh. For halal in industry, for halal in Thailand, start from before one point oh. It depends on individual of the ulama opinion. See? And then we start 70 years ago from 1949. We start uh, with the ulama to inspect the industry for exporting the slaughtering chicken to Kuwait. At that time, we start the certification. And then after that, maybe uh, about 20 years next, we have the inspector together with ulama. And then we have the 3.0 to have the scientists with the inspector and with the Urama to inspect the industry, you see. And then 4.0, we have uh, cyber for uh, Halan certification, Halan inspector, Halan scientist. And for Urama, we don't put the era to, to him. This is the construction of the Muslim community in Thailand start from the base about for about 5.4 million or 8% of the population under the law of Thailand every Muslim have the right to choose or to select the Islamic community or province we have 4,100 masjid or the or mosque in in Thailand so we have total 60,000 member committee of Masjid. And then outward to the Shaykhul Islam, we use the same way 
you see. And Shaykhul Islam in Thailand dated back more than 400 years ago. Because now number 18, the first is more than 400 years ago. This is the organization that linked to the CIMIX of the OIC. This CICOT linked to the CIMIX, the Standard and Metory Institute for Islamic Country of the OIC, which Thailand, you have known information yesterday that Thailand is the member now. And the Halal, uh, HSCC is the Halal Standard Control Committee, is the Halal AB, you see, accreditation body of, of uh, Halal Thailand. And division of Halal under Saikot and the Islamic Committee of Hawaii ICOP is the CB or certification body. For HSC, Hal Halal Science Center and the Halal Standard Institute of Thailand, HSIT is the supporting function for the scientific and academic support to organization under the cabinet resolution since 2004 and 2003. This is the mean that the product of Thailand under the Halan certification of Saikot uh, be accepted by Muslim country and non-Muslim country. We apply all sign to the supply chain and to the value chain the small chain and the supply chain, we also apply the scientists. Every process, you see, you can see, even uh, start from the raw material uh, until the hand of the consumer, until the, uh, and then before that, we have the halal logistic and uh, the way to traceability. With the close collaboration of the Central Islamic Council of Thailand and the Halan Science Center, Chirongkorn University. It means that uh, by this way, the product that also support by Halan Science is mean uh, uh, hygiene, it mean good quality, and it mean nutritious. This is the uh, sample of the innovation of the Halal Science Center to be from research to the product. We have the Halal clay soap and Halal cosmetic like uh, shampoo, conditioner, lotion. We also have the cosmeceutical product too. We use the Ahabatu Sauda and found that the product after research made more efficient than other product, uh, at least 30% more for the sun, protect sun protection cosmetic and anti-acne cream. The other innovation of Halan Science Center, uh, as we have the branches in Chiang Mai and the branches in Patani province, for Chiang Mai, we have what we call Habida. Habida is the Halal Big Data House because uh, uh, these uh, branches, they are very keen in uh, computer science, you see. So they have the platform of the Sophia. It's the, the platform for every application on this. You see. For the Bangkok, we have the, we call the Sahaba. Sahaba or scientific aided halal authentication for business assistant house in Bangkok for supporting the startup SME. We have the halal incubator too. And for the Patani branch, we have the, we call the Hafana. Hafana is the halal food and nutrition alert house in the Patani for consumer and communities benefit, you see, in, in the southern Patani. 
for the Halan forcing suicide function, you see, uh, not sending directly material or product to the uh, laboratory. Before that, we use the document, we check, and then interviewing the person concerned. In the end, the last method sent to the laboratory to analyze. This is the Halan Science Center Laboratory. We have the space of uh, more than 2,000 square meters in, in the laboratory, you see. We have the 163 state-of-art scientific equipment, 90 staff, and 50 out of them is scientists, is a Muslim scientist. We have uh, one non-Muslim scientist, and then they become to be Muslim for a period of three months. So about 10 years, we have uh, trained, uh, well, we have uh, analyzed more than uh, 100,000 uh, food products in 713 food plant. And we have a lot of equipment you can see, porcine gelatin, porcine protein, fatty acid, volatile substance, hormone, alcohol, animal DNA, porcine, and heavy metal. We have equipment to support. And this is the statistic that we got from the analyze between uh, 10 years that we have done. So a lot of uh, sample. This is a uh, inside the uh, Halan Science Center. We have the, the voice. Do you, you have the voice? Uh, this is in Halan Science Center, Chorongkorn University. If you have a chance, uh, welcome everyone to visit. Actually, we have the voice. We have the HALQ. Halan standardization application to the factory until to the hand of consumer. We have the traceability. It's a Muslim scientist, 50 person. For Thailand, Thailand Halal 4.0 Digital Classic and Theological Halal, we call this uh, initiation. This is a standardization that we apply to the factory about uh, three to five months per recipient on uh, small, medium, or large factory. The concept is if we can eliminate the haram or if we cannot eliminate, we can control or quarantine of haram. And the other is halal by four methods. Uh, preparation of document in class training, insight, consult, audit, and liberation. And food plan after this will uh, ready to prepare for certification of halal. This also we apply the HALQ standardized system to one uh, to 717 factories and more than 160,000 employees known about our system standardized cover or kitchen marine wakey milk fat or beverage animal products and this is what uh, dr and i have said about the active halal ingredient list for urgent needs for halal conformity system, you see. We have the, the E number used in the uh, food product factory a lot. So we categorize this, you see, from uh, uh, actually uh, more than thousand, thousand, thousand 
uh, chemical ingredient use, but popular use in Thailand is uh, uh, 320 uh, out of 348. So this is uh, very popular and used so often in Thailand. So we categorize it in three sections. Uh, 56% or 179, this is halal. So we can put H number uh, with the E number, you see, uh, tabulation. And for the must book, 116 or 36%, we qualification for halal status, have to qualify. And for 25 haram or 8%, we have to research and development for halal alternatives to replace it in these ingredients. For the must book, we do it in two ways, you see. For the halal accredited by trusted Islamic organization, then we accredit it halal or put H number, the signet under E number, you see. And in the H number book, and for without halal certification accreditation, so we check the status uh, from approved document review, and then interviewing the human or witness concern. After that, we send to the laboratory for analyze. This is the benefit of the H number book, you see, or H number table. This is to to help the industrial people to use instead of uh, if must we have to send to the laboratory and analyze it with uh, make uh, some more uh, cost of the product make the product so expensive you see so if we have the uh, H number book or H number table so we avoid to use the this method uh, this chemical uh, for material and then uh, we can uh, use the halal H number so no need to send to the laboratory to uh, have much more cost to the product See, because the cost of the laboratory is expensive it makes the product cannot compete in the market this is the what I have told in the beginning that this is a habitat, halal big data house in Chiang Mai. We have a, a small village like a, a circle valley for the programmer to, to think, to have the innovative, you see, to talking together about uh, their idea or something else in the village, like a circle valley. If you visited Chiang Mai, you can visit this village. This is the platform that uh, Habida, the Chiang Mai Halal Big Data, is from the Sophia. Sophia is the in the middle. Sophia is a system protocol for halal electronic resource exchange, and then we have the HalQ, Halal Assurance Liability Quality System. We have the Silk. Sharia compliant ICT logistic control and we have the ICRO identification of the curry raw material for assuring halalness under this platform and also have the data from the government see data from the government data from the in the second round you can see the data from the uh, entrepreneur data from the Islamic organization data from the academic and data from the public consumer from the five source. This is the halal for Poyo in Thailand, you see. All have the apply cyber except ulama. Because the ulama, they have to use the Al-Quran that uh, more than 1,400 years ago. And also Sunda and also Ijama Urama. You see, so they have no cyber. They can use a smartphone, but uh, have to ring to the Arquan. You see, but the other can use fintech, can use the cloud GP, can use the e uh, linked 
laboratory or can use many things. You see, under the process, under the process of halal certification. This we apply halal data management. Besides the halal certification on your left hand, you see, we call also apply the information or the data of the consumer, tourist, the e-commerce, the SME startup, manufacturer, restaurant, and software and other under the superior platform. Yes, uh, this is the Thailand Halas uh, SMD this year. Oh, thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Manat, for enlightening uh, presentations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have listened to six presentations from Istihala, uh, uh, Necessity, or Darura, and then we have a future food, we have fermented foods, and finally we have uh, Halal turning points. So we have now 10 minutes for question and answer sessions. And then uh, I would like to open this uh, QA sessions to the floor. Probably perhaps uh, two or three questions. If you want to ask, please raise your hand. And then uh, uh, we limit to three only. Yeah, to three. And then uh, please mention your name and the uh, organization where you are from, please. Yes. And to whom your question is addressed. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the brothers and sisters here in Thailand who organized this very important event. Thank you very much. And um, my question is to Professor Dr. Nazima. Um, and also the other question is to Dr. Daze. So let me, let me start with uh, Dr. Nazima. Um, I followed this in um, the impossible foods, the sideline, and it's okay. very interesting. Yeah. But now you give us, mashallah, very important uh, qu uh, information. What I would like to ask is, having seen the um, table, how the uh, people react this impossible food, uh, is it to do with, because there is no much difference between the in, uh, in vitro meat and GMO, because both of them, you take the chain from a uh, source and then you insert to something else to create mm. the in vitro. Is that because of the acceptance, because of the, the GMO, people, they did not accept the GMO. Is it the same as in vitro as well? And uh, my question to Dr. Daze is, what is the ruling of um, MUI regarding the chemosine enzymes added to the G's? Because you said if it's from pork, Obvious is haram, but if it's from young calves, from beef, what's the ruling of that, which is not slaughtered according to the Islam? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just keep the question number. The second, yes, please, from Pakistan. Please make it short, yeah, because we are running out of time. Salam if possible, only one question is allowed. Yeah, please. only one question. I would like to ask uh, from the sister. Yeah, Prof. Uh, Nazima. Is there uh, the, the sister? Uh, is there any study for the side effect of uh, synthetic meat? One thing we are innovating something, but is that are we still focusing on the side effects of, of that? Yes, you get a question. And the last one, yes. So you want to ask? Yes. My question is a very simple one to Dr. Daishi from uh, Indonesia. He said that brewer's yeast is halal, can be halal if it's cleaned. How could brewer's yeast be halal? 
because as far as we are concerned, it's definitely haram. Thank you. So we limit to three uh, uh, persons only. And first, I would like to invite the Prof. Nazima. You can answer from that, Prof. There are two questions for you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes? All right. Um, so you were asking me about whether you would categorize it as being genetically modified because you, it involves the um, use of genes. Uh, that's a very interesting question. In fact, uh, that was, um, you know, that paper that I was talking about uh, that was done on American consumers, that was the main concern, whether it would be classified as a GM food because you, you are inserting genes. But uh, you've got to look at it because you're actually developing genes from it. You're not modifying the genes in any way. So uh, that's something, um, because it's new, uh, that's why we, we probably need to carry out more studies on this and find out you know, whether to classify it as a GM food or not because there's no studies. Uh, no categorization based on this, but this is a question that people often ask, and that's why people are a bit uh, fearful about eating it because GM is often associated negatively uh, by consumers. Is that all right? Thank you. Yes, uh, Prof, can you answer all the questions addressed to you, bro? No. Oh. All right. Your questions, brother. Very good one. Side effects. Yes, uh, you, you probably need to carry out toxicological studies um, on this. Yeah, maybe we, we can talk to Dr. Professor Mossad because he's a toxicologist. You know? So <laughs> probably I will have this conversation with him after this. And then uh, maybe we, we can have a discussion because that's something that is really interesting know about side effects because when you are making a food like this you are, you are having to add other things as well because you want to simulate the flavor and the texture of meat so this could be of concern so um, I would say what ingredients you put in you know what you're putting in so you've just got to make sure they are they are safe and if they are generally regarded as safe that shouldn't be a problem but if you're adding, again, if you're adding emulsifiers uh, from the last talk, we've got to make sure that it's halal. So those, those are the things, I think, which, are, which is of more concern. And then, um, yeah, I'll probably have a discussion and get back to you about the toxicology. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you, Pronazima. Dr. Dase, there are two questions for you, please. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the questions. Uh, the first is about uh, the using uh, chymosin from the calf, uh, the young cow, uh, for example. Uh, okay. Uh, there are also one applications, uh, for example, and also an issue about uh, this uh, chymos chymosin as a uh, replacing rennet uh, when making a cheese. Uh, so in Indonesia also, uh, there, are, there is one uh, company who try to apply uh, for these uh, halal certifications using chemo chemosin instead of rennet. And then they have uh, a uh, halal certificate of these chemosins uh, from uh, USA. So uh, they use uh, the chemosin uh, from USA. And then uh, because we are as a food technologist, we are not make the patua uh, we are only uh, make uh, information uh, to the uh, Patwa MOE. But in the end, uh, based on the information and then uh, something like that. So uh, this uh, company using uh, chemosin uh, can be certified as halal. Pardon me? MOI. Yes. And then uh, the second question. Uh, the second question. Uh, about the brewer yeast, as mentions that uh, pure uh, because microbe is not false. Microbe is also a god creatures. Allah made uh, the uh, microbe as well. So uh, the brewer yeast, uh, the brewer yeast, uh, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Saccharomyces cerevisiae also used in bread. 
used also for making uh, beer. Used also is the same as Saccharomyces. So uh, these cultures actually uh, they are uh, they they were this year's Athena Toy in based on uh, what it means is work as uh, it is what as God create uh, the yeast. For example, changing uh, the glucose into ethanol. Is that the question? So uh, that's why, uh, based on the information or, uh, or, uh, in LPPOMOMI, and you can check online, so this uh, brewery yeast is uh, considered halal. And this information as well, that's why uh, uh, regarding the ISTI Hala as well, I will inform uh, to the college there and also to the Halal Science Center in IPB. I have also the same uh, question as you because I work, uh, I have an experience working as a part time uh, auditor uh, from uh, HFCA, Halal Food Country uh, Europe. And then uh, I have to uh, check one of the breweries as well. And then in this time, I have no idea I'm not checking uh, to the MOI website during my study in Germany. And then when I check, I suddenly uh, directly reviews that. What it means, uh, recommended not to uh, certify this uh, brewery yeast. Because of, but when I ask to Halal, uh, uh, to LPPM, um, what about this to one auditor uh, of LPPM MUI? Is it okay, uh, for example, about the breweries? And then there is an explanation when it is uh, not only physically, as uh, Istihala says, not only physically and chemically, and then it has to be uh, how to explain? It has, uh, it has to be uh, back into the pure Saccharomyces cerepice again. So it can be uh, considered as, as halal. That's. Uh, that's my explanation, but I will inform this also based on the information from uh, Dr. Mufti to uh, my colleagues. Oh, when uh, you need about these information, you can uh, check online in LPPOM MUI about the patwa regarding the breweries. Okay, thank you. Can you stop here? Uh, you may discuss with Dr. Dase directly after the session. With that, uh, on behalf of the chairperson of the session, thank you very much. For your kind attention, thank you all the speakers, and I return back to the uh, uh, MC of the session. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Thank you, thank you all, all speaker, for giving us the knowledge and more inside information about a uh, role of scientists on halal industry. Uh, in this occasion, I would like to invite Miss Sulida Wangji, uh, Assistant Director of the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, for talking to award a token of appreciation to our chairman and speakers. Please welcome. Oh. May I invite all of you to come down on the floor? Okay. First, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Irwandi. Professor Dr. Irwandi, just with me, have your big round of applause. <laughs> Mufti Arif Alisha. Professor Dr. Mozart Abdel Wahab. <laughs> Professor Dr. Mozart Abdel Wahab.
Okay, Professor Dr. Nazima Hamid. Dr. Dase Hunayfi. And Mr. Manasif Santikun. And then may I invite all of speakers to come together for a photo session. Photo session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, because, because of the limit of time, so we will start the technical session three now. The technical session three is uh, the